Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is nine o'clock, which means it's time for a talk magic. And I'm here with somebody I've talked about on the channel a hell of a lot. The best coin magician in the world, in my opinion. One of the best performers in the world. A huge inspiration to many, many magicians and an absolute legend in the magic community. And also one of the nicest people I've ever met. He'd help absolutely anyone. I am, of course, talking about... Mr. Eric Jones, how you doing, man? You okay? Oh, I thought you were going to say Justin Wilman, but that's cool. I like that. That's oh, good. That's good. It's all you. It's yeah, all you. Man. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. I'm doing good. Thank you so much for having me. I knew we were trying to coordinate times, but I'm glad we were able to sit down and do this. So am I, because, I mean, I know how busy you are, and you were just telling me off camera that business is picking up for you again, which is great. So, uh, you know, you're right. Trying to coordinate this has been interesting, but we got it. And I'm loving, i got to say before I start, I haven't seen you since you got the beard. It looks awesome. And oh, I yeah. love the jumper as well. I love the sweater. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I started growing in it down here because I, I was losing it up here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you got to compensate wherever you can, you know? Looks good. Looks good. Looks sure. really good. Thank you. Looks Thank really you. good. But, you know, there's going to be a lot of people that are watching this interview. They, they've heard of Eric Jones. They know who you are. But different people will know you for different things. Some people might know you for Penn & Teller or AGT. Some people might know you for working with various different companies and bringing out various different effects. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about all of it. And I suppose the first question for anybody that doesn't know who Eric Jones is, I'd like to start off. And I know you're a big Marvel fan, so let's use a comic book reference. Let's go into the origin story of Eric Jones. Let's talk about where you came from and how you kind of got into magic. So, well, where, 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 where the whole thing with great power comes great responsibility. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it's a it's a humble beginnings. You know, um, I come from two parents, like most of us. Um, I've got a brother, three years my junior, and uh, we grew up in the geographical center of Virginia, the state of Virginia, in an area called Buckingham County and um you know very rural area so rural in fact that it was a 20 minute car ride to the closest gas station 45 minute ride to the closest walmart or uh, target um and hour and a half to the closest shopping mall so our family didn't get out a lot um we were kind of studious um, my brother and i learned how to paint how to draw how to sculpt but i didn't get bit by the magic bug until, bug until i was an adult you know, there's a magic shop uh, in Richmond, which is about an hour away from me, uh, that I got my father, convinced my father to take me to. And that was the first time I got to see magic up close and personal. Of course, we'd seen it on things like, we have a thing called The World's Greatest Magic, which would come on uh, on NBC every Thanksgiving. Um, we had a few other shows that were popping on, got to see David Copperfield, of course. and But to see it that close in my face freaked me out. So I didn't have money at the time, broke college kid. Uh, so when I had a few dollars saved, I drove back to the magic shop myself and I bought my first magic. I bought a diamond penny. I bought um, a Michael Lamar video, VHS, aging myself, um, <laughs> called The Complete Introduction to Coin Magic by Michael Lamar. So you got to learn all of the basics. And I bought a copy of Bobo's, uh, some sponge balls and a Dave Hudspath A1 video on how to use the sponge balls. And I pretty much studied the book Bobos. I used the video, but I only had access to a VHS player every once in a while, so I didn't get to see the two videos that I bought. But that book, Bobos Modern Coin Magic, which I still have my copy, it's tattered. I thought about magic, and the study of magic, the way I think about studying anything else, like college or whatever. So I had a highlighter that I was highlighting points that I wanted to remember. I was making notes in the margins. Now, if you were to look at my copy, the, the it's literally ripped in half. The cover's missing, pages are dog-eared. It's really well-worn. Um, and I really thought about the magic, not only from the audience's standpoint, I mean, from my standpoint, but from the audience's standpoint as well. What they see, how I want them to remember the magic, and how I could utilize the time that I was spending studying versus performing to figure out how to bridge the gap between what they see and what I want them to remember. And that pretty much was the start of how I, I think about magic, how I engage with people when it comes to magic. And that's led to a lot of the stuff that's happened to me over the past 20 years. Now, let me ask you a question. When, when you started studying Bobos and you started really kind of taking studying magic seriously, was your goal to become a full-time magician or a performer? Or was it just, hey, this is a hobby that I'm going to take seriously? Um, the truth of the matter is where I'm from, if you get out of there, 
you're a success. <laughs> I had no idea because I'm such such a small area in the middle of Virginia. I would never had aspirations to even travel to California. You know, I never thought I'd leave Virginia. A good weekend for us was to go into the next town and kind of like parking lot pimp outside of the Walmart. That's that's where I grew up. That was that was a good Saturday night. So um, I didn't have big aspirations. I had no idea where magic would take me. My goal, because I was kind of socially awkward, was I was hoping that magic would help me create icebreakers that I could use to um, open my social circles, maybe open the dating pool. Um, and, you know, it would have been cool to make some money from it because I, I was reading that, you know, there are professionals who travel all over the world and do this. But I'd never even heard of a magic shop at that point. So, I mean, well, I had only heard of a magic shop at that point, I mean to say. So I had no yeah. idea where it would take. So I just wanted to be able to make friends who thought I was interesting and, you know, you know, get laid. Nice. Good goal. So when, when was it that you kind of started thinking to yourself, you know what, I'm getting pretty good at this. I could maybe do this as a career and, and actually this might even take me places. Was there a moment where you were kind of like, OK, this is what I want to do? Um, I've always felt like I didn't choose magic. Magic chose me. So I remember the first time I was booked to do a show. At that point, I did 45 minutes. <laughs> it was all coins and 75% coins across. And that's when I realized, you know what? I need to do something different because there's no way anyone's going to pay me to do this again. Because after the, you know, 15 minutes in, people were like, okay, I know it's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I know it's going to go from there to there or from there to there. Cause that's all I had. And I knew two card tricks at the time. So I knew I had to switch things up. So I asked the owner of the magic shop, if he wouldn't mind if I came in on Saturdays and uh, hung out. And he said, I'll do you one better than that. Uh, Cause I want you to learn more magic, get behind the counter, learn a few of the magic tricks. And those are the magic tricks I want you to show to people so that I can make some money and you can get the experience. And after three or four months of that, I was like, I'm not bad. I'm not great, but I'm not bad. And then I heard other professionals who would come in on Saturdays because that was the hangout day. All the professionals would get together and I would hear them talk about the gigs that they did and, you know, the, the types of work environments. And I'm like, well, I, I could do that. Uh, so the big thing back then was restaurant magic. And the, the biggest magician in our area, he was doing nine restaurants a week and was telling us how much he was making from doing those nine. And I was like, can I ask a question? How do, how do I get started in that? And he told me to look right behind me. And there was a book by Jim Sisti called The Magic Menu. Uh, he says, buy that. Everything that I learned about how to do restaurant magic, I learned from that book. So I immediately bought the book and I learned everything about it. And I got started in restaurants. And after I got my third restaurant, I was like, you know what? This could be, this could be an interesting way to make a living. And that's where I got started. Of course, I worked regular jobs to supplement my income, or actually, I would say I would use magic to supplement my income while working regular jobs. But, you know, the transition happened um, several years later. I was working for an insurance agency, and most people who know me from the magic community know I was working for a company called State Farm, and I was a claims adjuster. So, you know, you get into an accident, I'm the guy who comes out, I appraise the damage to your vehicle, and, you know, write the check. And the situation happened where a, a young lady uh, mother of three, she was commuting 45 minutes each way to go to work. And she got into an accident, completely totaled her vehicle. I come out to write the, to write the check for the damage to the vehicle after assessing it. She looks at the check that I hand her. She's like, I can't buy another car for this. And I'm like, I apologize, ma'am, but based on the year of your car, the mileage, the damage, this is what, you know, my form says I, I have to offer. And she cried on, literally cried on my shoulder. And she says, you're basically telling me I have no way to support my family anymore. And I felt horrible. Uh, so even though I couldn't do anything in the scope of my job, I went to the church that I was going to and I told them about the situation. And they put a collection together, offered her, you know, a little bit more money. I delivered the money to her. And I don't know what she told my job, the insurance company, but they fired me for that. Uh, which was a blessing in disguise because at that moment between the restaurant performances that I was doing and lecturing and, and speaking at uh, magic conventions, I was making more money doing that than I was working for a Fortune 50 company. So I was able to transition from working regular jobs into professional magic back in 2009 and haven't looked back since. Wow, that's amazing. 
Now, I want to I want to I want to uh, backtrack a little bit slightly because Definitely. you mentioned about uh, about your first show being predominantly coin magic. Yeah, we know you as an incredible coin magician, and you've you've spoken very freely about how important it is to learn coin magic. You, most people that get into magic, they start with card tricks because there's no barrier to entry. You can learn a self-working trick and do it immediately. But with coin magic, there's some work that takes place. You know, you have to learn to conceal a coin. You have to learn to palm a coin. You have to get over that magician's guilt. Did you find, uh, you know, and you also talked about how your first things were Diamond Penny and Bobo's. It sounds like your journey into magic was very different to a lot of people in that there was a strong, heavy focus on coin magic. Do you think that helped you as a performer or do you think it hindered you because you didn't have that kind of traditional route in? Well, um, the reason I think I started with coin magic is because it was what was first introduced to me. The guy at the magic shop had a really unique routine that he did with a jar with the dime and the penny. Uh, so I started with that and then he suggested coin magic. But as I've become a little bit more well read in magic in general, I think uh, the natural progression should begin with coin magic, and that was uh, cemented for me uh, with a book called Edwin Sachs Sleight of Hand. And in the introduction to the book, it says that you should learn coin magic first because you learn how to be natural holding out to get rid of that guilt. And it, with coin magic, you can learn how to manipulate any small object, which is a skill that you can take with you anywhere in life. Once you've understood the basic foundation of sleight of hand with coin magic, then you branch out with card magic, and that's how you learn how to present. That's how you learn how to tell a story. That's how you learn how to connect with an audience really and truly, and you can expand uh, your coin magic repertoire because of that. Uh, and then from there, you can either branch out and go to stand up or platform magic, or you can go into mentalism, or you can go into the stage magic. But the natural progression, progression is to start with the coin magic and then branch outward from there. So I wish more people would do that. I think if more people spent time with the coins instead of the cards, then their sleight of hand with card magic would be more deceptive. I, I see quite a few people that when they execute a sleight, they blink, their shoulders tense up, their body language shifts. And if they started with coin magic, they would learn how to get rid of that immediately. Because with a, a pack of playing cards, you're manipulating one object amongst 51 others. Uh, with coin magic, it's you, that object, against your audience. So your body language has to be deceptive in order to deceive your audience. Um, so I, one of the first things you learn how to do is how to watch your spectator's eyes. Their eyes will tell you if, you, if they've been fooled by what you've shown. And if they're not, you study from that, you adjust, you grow, you uh, repeat the situation. Um, so I, yeah, to, the short answer is yes, I started with coin magic, but I do believe coin magic is the right way to begin all magic. And then you branch out from there. I think you're, you're working with one hand tied behind your back. If you're starting with self-working card tricks, instead of learning a skill that you can use throughout your life with the, the coin magic. I completely agree. So for anybody watching this that hasn't really gone down that coin magic route, would your advice be, you know what, take what you're doing and that's awesome. But pick up some coins and, and, and kind of go back to basics when it comes to that sort of thing. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Now, here's the thing, Eric. I want to, uh, I'll tell you when you first came on my radar. And there's a reason I'm telling you this. The first time you came on my radar is you were very active on the Magic Cafe in the coin magic section. And this is going back so many years. And you, everybody, and, and, you know, back then, the coin magic section on the cafe was the who's who, David Neighbors and, you know, uh, everybody, you know, Michael Rubenstein, everyone was on there. And you were just blowing people away with your karate coin. Everyone was like, have you seen Eric Jones' karate oh, coin? Have you seen this kid? Okay, have you yeah. seen this kid? That was what everyone was talking about. Not your karate coin and your, your, your coin magic. Now, we know you, put aside the performance side of things for a minute. We know you as a creator and we know you as a lecturer, one of the top creators and lecturers in the world. And we'll get to that in a minute. Did that all start with those early days on the Magic Cafe, sharing your creations? Uh, and was your, did you have a desire to eventually start releasing Magic yourself? Or was it just a case of, hey, I've come up with this. I want to just share it with, with other people. Where, where did that desire for creativity come in uh, or um. releasing Magic? That's a great question. I, I've never been asked that before. Um, I believe I, I work. I've worked backwards because uh, you know, in the magic community, I became known as a creator, lecturer before I became known as a performer. 
um, because my focus was on um, developing sleight of hand sequences that I enjoyed, that my audiences enjoyed, that I assumed magicians would enjoy as well. But it all came from um, my peers at the magic shop, you know, working there Saturday night in, Saturday night out. Um, I got to hang with some incredible people. I got to bring in, I hired all the lecturers that came in. Uh, so I got to meet some incredible people, work with some really good uh, names in magic. And I was a sponge. I wanted to learn from everyone and uh, had questions about not how things were done, but why that works for you. Why is such a, 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 a transparent slight so fooling to an audience? Like the misdirection thing, like me leaving a coin in the middle of a close-up mat that I can pretend like I've made a vanish and it appears on the table, even though it's in plain sight. Why does that work? Not how, the house anybody can do, but why the timing? So I spent a lot of time on that. And I, over time, I developed a few sequences that magicians would be like, hey, look, you know, Eric, uh, he's never seen that thing you do with the, where you don't, I won't say what it is, but you know that thing. And I would be like, okay, so they think that's good. And then people would ask me, have you published that? I'm like, what, what do you mean publish? What does that mean? And they're like, no, you know, like you sell the stuff behind the wall, but they're like, I can do that? I hadn't thought about it. And it was in 2004 that my local IBM ring asked if I'd be willing to do a lecture. And I'm like, lecture on what? And they were like, well, you've got a lot of things. Like you gave me tips on that. You gave me tips on that. And, and put all that together in a set of lecture notes. You want me to be an author to a booklet? I, I can't do that. Well, I guess I could. And it turned into me doing a, a free lecture because I'm like, I'm not charging people for this. I'll give them you know, the ideas that I've come up with, but I don't think anything's original. You know, I've hung around David Blaine and uh, enough to know that nothing's original under the sun, you know, because he's such a huge researcher. And um, I did a lecture in 2005. I wrote a set of lecture notes called Fingertips Part Two, which was my homage to Stevie Wonder because that was his first major accomplishment in the world of music. This was my first big splash in the world of magic. And even though it was a free lecture, I advertised it on the Magic Cafe and a few other places. And uh, our normal attendance is around 30 or 40 people. The attendance for this lecture, with people who RSVP'd was so big, we had to leave our normal lecturing space and we had to book a space at the Science Museum and their lecture hall. I had over 150 people who showed up from three states, neighboring states, to come to this lecture. And I made printed up 50 copies of the lecture notes saying, you know, I'm going to sit on these forever, but I'm not going to charge for them. And then at the lecture, they said, no, you should charge 20 bucks for them. And I sold out of all 50 that day. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm on to something. We need to do this again sometime soon. And that was the starting point to me, um, lecturing and becoming more active there. As far as the Magic Cafe is concerned, and I'm sorry, that's a long way to go to get. Oh, this is great. This is, this is perfect. Yeah. Um, as far as the Magic Cafe was concerned, I, because I'm a sponge, because I wanted to know as much as I could, I used the Magic Cafe as proving grounds for things that I was showing the guys to get a larger audience. So I was posting videos of things that I thought magicians would enjoy, but also to get feedback because I'm reading the books from like Di Vernon where he's writing letters to other magicians and they're going back and forth about things that they're doing differently for the same types of routines. So I wanted to meet Chris Kenner. I wanted to meet uh, Troy Hooser. I wanted to meet uh, David Neighbors, who I've been reading their material, performing their material, and I've got some things that I think are a little bit different because of the way I think about magic. And I wanted to get their, their, their takes on things. And I developed friendships, online friendships with a lot of people and that, in, inspired confidence in me to branch out more and um, I never really considered myself like a resource the way I would consider like a Dave Neighbors or Chris Kenner but the fact that you know my peers considered me an equal has always been more than I've ever expected and more than I deserve in, in some instances and I'm very 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 thankful and blessed to have uh, considered so many people uh, friends and colleagues in the magic industry. That's great. That's absolutely fantastic. And, and off the back of doing that lecture, obviously, eventually, you started bringing out magic props and, and magic routines. And I, I, I might be wrong, but I think that the first stuff you brought out was with Cosmo Magic, wasn't it? Yes. Um, from memory, there was the Twister, the, the, the card routine, which was incredible. And is it Mirage et toi? I think. Mirage et toi, yeah. The first, that yeah. was the very first piece. So the way that all worked is- That was incredible. Uh, Oh, thank you, brother. I was at a, a magic convention and I met Cosmo and he's this um, 
really loud. I call I consider him obnoxious, but you know he's like a father figure. You know he's an incredible guy. Um, he 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 showed me that he was producing this thing called Real Magic Magazine, and he showed me he had this video called um, Live at the Jailhouse with a bunch of magicians, one of which was Justin Miller, and it was my first exposure to Justin Miller's magic. <sighs> Talk about that later, um, <laughs> but. Um, I fell in love with the project and I was like, I, I would love to work with you. I don't know if, if what I have to offer is marketable, but I'll show you. I had this huge list of routines, about about 50 things that I'd come up with. And he went through them. I did all of the routines, showed him all of the tricks were worked. And we ended up coming up with what would have been four DVDs worth of magic. Uh, and he was like, yeah, you know, it might cost a little bit too much to make a four DVD set. What if we do a three DVD set and we split a couple of things off into different projects? I'm like, okay, cool. If you think they're strong enough to do it as different projects, I'll do that. So an extension of me, we filmed an extension of me, which is my three DVD set. But they were like, well, no one really knows who you are in the world at large. Maybe if we throw one gem out there, we'll see how people respond to that. And that'll let us know how this three DVD set's going to go. So we put out Mirage Etoile, which is just a three coin routine, a production of three coins, three flies and a vanish of three coins uh, that I used in the restaurants all the time. And it was a hell of a success. So it let Cosmo know that he should put the more money into it. And we also included the little karate coin, which people knew me for back then, into the whole set. And that came out after and then twisted after that. Um, and it, it, it led to me being able to travel around the world. Cosmo believing in me, guys like Mike Miller, who gave me my first international lecture opportunity. Um, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for, for guys like that who took a risk on a country boy from Virginia. It's incredible. And obviously, eventually, you then went and landed at Illusionist, and you were doing a lot of projects with them back in the day. Yeah. Including what I think is one of the, if not the best series of coin routines ever created, which is the metal series. Um, and the thing I recommend to anybody who wants to get into coin magic. Um, d d when you were there at Illusionist, did you go in wanting to make something that would be so, sort of have such a profound effect on the industry or no? It was just. So I, I got, for, thank you for the question. I got, I got a call from, um, a, a guy that I met at a magic convention uh, named Jason Brumbelow, who at the time, he was the VP of Illusionist. And he was looking for someone that had a good style, had a good way in front of the camera, had some technical chops that he could use to be a consultant for some of the projects that were, they were bringing in that had great ideas, but weren't fully fleshed out. Uh, so he wanted to be able to say, okay, we need you to develop, develop that into a fully fledged product. So they put me on payroll and I did that for a while. Uh, and then I ended up being the face for a couple of projects. Um, and I'm gonna put this on the record because he's told his side of the story. I've never come out and said my side of the story. So Craig, this is an exclusive for you. Your audience will be the first people to hear it from my mouth other than in my, my small circle of friends. We were talking about Justin Miller and I made a face earlier. Yeah. And the reason I made a face is because uh, Justin and I used to be really great friends, but he's bashed me in public forums because he feels like I stole the metal series from him. The story as I understand it is he approached illusionist J Jason Brumbelow with that idea. And Jason Brumbelow or the whatever the powers that be at illusionist decided that he either wasn't the right fit for this project or they've had problems with him in the past and he's sometimes hard to work with. And they just decided not to do that. But the idea is still on the table. The idea doesn't belong to anyone. And when you stop and think about it, outside of Bobo's, Dr. Michael Rubenstein has an entire encyclopedia of coin slights. Michael Amar's complete introduction to coin magic is how I got started in magic. Um, uh, Jay Nobazato with Penguin created a DVD uh, about coin, a uh, video about coin magic. So it's not like it was an original idea. The original thing was he, Justin Miller wanted to do it. So I was asked if I'd be willing to do it. They said they didn't want to work with Justin, wanted to know if I'd be willing to do it. And I'm like, well, um, I'll do it if you allow me to do some of the things that I've created so that it has m my take on it rather than me just giving you know points from Bobo's because I feel like a lot of things in Bobo's are outdated. So let's make it more contemporary. And they love the idea. Uh, so I filmed it with them. Metal One went gangbusters. 
to the point where within the first week, I'd signed a contract to do Metal 2 and 3. Metal 2 and 3 went gangbusters to the point where a year later I did Metal 4. And then I did Metal 5 just last year during the pandemic, as a matter of fact. So um, over the past 10 years, that five video collection um, has has inspired a lot of people to do coin magic, but it was never my intention. Um, I originally took it because I'm like, yeah, that means rent will be paid on time this month. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I did it because I'm like, okay, I, I, I wasn't thinking about legacy. I wasn't thinking about the impact it might leave on the magic community. I was like, that, make sure that bills will be paid. Yes, mm -hmm. I'll do it. So I did put work, a lot of work into it. I curated magic tricks from not only myself, but I reached out to people like Dean Dill before he passed away. And I wanted to put it on Metal One, uh, his no extras routine, the barehanded assembly before, mm -hmm. it could be for any of any object before coins. Um, and he gave me permission to put it on Metal 2 since he wasn't able to give me permission to put it on Metal 1. Then he passed away just after that. So I'm, I'm blessed that uh, I made, made friends with Dean because he was such an incredible creator and performer. Um, but I, it, right place, right time, you know, uh, they say that your network is your net worth. And I feel like that is has been the case in my entire career. I've been able to position myself around the right people who are able to give me opportunities. They're able to open doors for me that I, I couldn't on my own. And forever grateful, forever grateful. Well, I mean, all I can say is you've worked with a lot of companies and I've spoken to a lot of people at these companies and nobody ever has anything but praise for you. Even if you no longer work there or you've moved on, everybody has just nothing but nice things to say about you. So it's obviously you've left an impact with them. It's obviously you've left them with a good impression of you, else they wouldn't be saying that. So, you know. Well, you know, I I I was raised to treat everyone like you want to be treated, and I, I do that as as often as I can. Um, I've have very few um, negative uh, negative in interactions with people, and when I do, I try to kill it right then, so that we walk away agreeing to disagree rather than having animosity for one another. Uh, I think life's too short to focus on the bullshit. Excuse my language. I just, I, th I think it is. Um, so I, I try whenever possible to make sure that even if we disagree, we understand where each other's coming from. And while we might not agree, we can, we can be civil, have a civil discourse. I completely agree. Absolutely. 100%. Let me ask you one question about this whole journey of creativity and releasing magic. Um, a lot of new people that come into magic, they want to be a creator. That, that, and I think it's because you come into magic and we put the creators of magic on pedestals, don't we? And it's kind of like, oh, we my do. gosh, there we do. And, and I think people think that if you become a creator of magic, you're going to become instantly a millionaire and, and, and have notoriety and so on and so forth. I suppose the question I'm asking is, what advice would you give anybody that's watching this? that's desperate to release their own magic, as somebody who's worked with Murphy's, Illusionist, Penguin, Cosmo, literally you've worked with every single major magic company and producer and wholesaler on the planet. There's hardly anybody who has more experience in this sort of area than you. What advice would you give anybody that wants to become a creator of magic? Trust the process. Trust the process. Um, you, can't, you can't be a creator of magic until you have a definition of what magic is to you. Um, you know, um, every, every magician should have an idea of what magic should look like in their mind and then find ways to replicate that, uh, in your, in your body of work. Um, but before you can even do that, you need to understand magic, um, as it exists in the world. Um, Garrett Thomas is a big fan of saying his definition of magic is a new and impossible moment, which I think is simple, but it's potent. So if you think about the first sunset you've ever saw, the first uh, rainbow, your first kiss or your, your second kiss if the first one was trash, uh, those things are, uh, are new and impossible moments. With magic tricks, you have to think about that, but from the audience's standpoint, uh, what feels new, what feels impossible, what feels like a surprise, and then go through other people's work and understand while you're performing this, why things worked. And until you can understand why their magic worked, you'll never create anything original um, because originality is going to come from replication. You know, you have to you have to imitate in order to uh, invite and in, invent. 
Um, so um, trust the process. Go through those steps. Be an imitator. Learn other people's work and why it works before you try to change anything. But at the same time, you know, um, Eugene Berger used to say there are many rooms in the House of Magic. And I feel like those who feel like it is their purpose, it's their destiny to be a creator. Like there's some natural born creators, Marcus Eddy, Kaylin Morelli, the, uh, Blake Voigt. Those guys are, they're just on another world. You know, um, Nicholas Lawrence, another one. They're just, they think about magic differently than everyone else. So even if they don't spend all the time in the world studying all the variations of a cards across, each of those guys could come up with a way to do a cards across that would be completely different than anything we've ever seen before. So they are in their own lane. They're in their own room of magic. Most of us, we need to go down a specific path that'll lead us to that path to creativity. And you really just have to have to trust that process. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And when it comes to, let's say somebody was watching this and they've got a trick and they're, they're happy with it and they've worked it out and they feel it's creative. They've shown it around to lots of people. It's as far as they're aware, original and unique and no one else has done it. They feel like sellable product. They've worked it in the real world, so on and so forth. And it comes time to working out how to actually put that trick out to magicians. What would you say is the best approach? Is it self-publishing it, going through a, uh, a distributor? And, and, and how do you pick? There's so many magic tricks coming out these days. Like, is there a, any advice on that subject? I, I think the first thing you have to ask yourself is how viable it is as a product. If it's all sleight of hand, you're going to go down one path. If it's something that requires manufacturing, especially something that's complex, um, you're going to have to go down another path. The, the second part to that is your where you live. Um, because even though the internet has brought us together, uh, someone in Australia doesn't have the same access as I do living an hour and a half away from New York City, where there's, you know, some of the best minds in magic. So um, if, if, if it's a sleight of hand trick, which means it's probably going to end up being a download, um, it's a crapshoot, unless it's something that's extremely rare, uh, something that's absolutely, like, Eric Chen had that little coin vanish, where it looks like it just winks out of view. Even though that's sleight of hand, that's something that looks like CGI, it hasn't been done anywhere, so that's something that people were going to fight for. He could have taken that to any company. And then, of course, the fact that he won FISM, you know, that makes it more marketable. Um, but he, if had he started off as a guy like me who had absolutely nothing and created that, uh, it would still be marketable, but you'd have less options. So um, for a sleight of hand piece of magic, it's a, you're rolling the dice as to whether or not a company's going to like it. But don't be afraid of no. If you get a no from one, the next one may say yes. And you just weigh your options when you get that deal and go for whatever will, if, uh, will Go for what, whatever will help you out in the long term. Never go for the short term. A lot of people are going to say, hey, look, we'll offer you five grand or we'll give you 25% royalty in perpetuity. If it's something you believe in, that, that royalty deal is going to help you longer. You'll get checks for a longer amount of time and it'll probably far exceed that little five grand that you get the day of or when you sign the contract. That's sleight of hand. When it comes to things that require manufacturing, if you've got a really cool trick and you have, haven't got a name, but you're trying to build a name for yourself, you have, to allow, you have to allow people to make money on you. And that's something I found out in, in all aspects as a, as a talent creator. You have, to, you have to allow people to make money on you so that they can build trust in you to further f future projects. Of course, the big three, Theory 11, Illusionist, Penguin, um, those, those are the places that you want to go first. But there's a lot of smaller companies, like Nicholas Lawrence has his own uh, company. Uh, there's a bunch of others that, uh, you know, Cosmo is a, a bigger player than he used to be, but, you know, still smaller than the big three. Uh, shit, even um, Murphy's now has a production company. So um, you're going to have to, once again, like with the sleight of hand, you're going to have to weigh the, the options that you're given. But the bigger the company, the smaller percentage they're usually going to offer. And sometimes you have to accept that smaller percentage because if you have other things that you'd like to work with them on in the long term, they're more likely to come back and work with you again. Like I haven't worked for Illusionist in 10 years, eight years. And, you know, 
we're working on a project together right now. So it, it's, it, you can get longevity if you have a good track record. Um, but again, don't be afraid of no. If one company says no, oh shit, if all of the companies say no, then you're t you turn to self-publication. You know, do it in smaller batches. Shoot the video with the best quality camera you have. I've got a, I just got an iPhone 13. It's comparable to my DSLR. So you can do it all yourself. You can edit it on your phone and have a, a really cool download that you can sell in small numbers until you can get the money necessary to get a bigger batch. That's what I did with Twisted. I did Twisted um, myself, and I sold hundreds of comp copies before t uh, uh, Cosmo Magic said, hey, look, how come you won't do this with us? I'm like, because I was just going to do it myself. But, you know, if you want to do it, we can we can mass produce it. And we, mass, we were able to put some money up and get it mass produced. So don't be afraid to self-publish as well. Just like the whole thing about there are many rooms in the in the House of Magic, same thing applies when it comes to creation and trying to trying to get your name out there. But definitely don't be afraid to let people make a few dollars off of you to gain the uh, the personal relationship to work with them in the future. That's huge because if you burn that bridge, there's only two ways to look at that: either you burned a bridge that you can never cross again, or that fire has lit your way as you <laughs> you travel down the road alone. Um, and I prefer not to burn bridges at all, if, if at all possible, because you never know, you know, the, if the same people you pass on the way up, you'll see them on your way back down. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Sorry, that was another long oh, answer. Really good advice. Totally agree with you. Absolutely brilliant advice. Here's the thing, Eric. You have, obviously, we talked way back in, early on in the interview about how you went full-time pro um yeah i think you said 2000 and 2009 2009 so for many many years now for 13 14 years you've been a full-time professional performer but you've also had this parallel career as a full-time professional uh, sort of creator inventor lecturer you know you, you, there's been periods of time where you've worked with illusionist or you've worked with murphys or this or that and the other mm -hmm. has, it, has it been hard to balance those two aspects of your uh, you're like, is the one that you prefer doing or do, do you like the balance of having the creativity, the outlet for your creativity, whilst at the same time having an outlet for your performance, I suppose, is the best way to put it. So I'm, I'm going to start off right now and say that I, I've never considered myself a creator. I'm not necessarily inventive, especially not like when you hold a candle up to guys like Nicholas Lawrence, Marcus Eddy, you know, that lot. But... I, um, I do enjoy the creative process, not in, to, to foster creativity, but to go down a path to find venues that are, to find ideas that may not have resonated with an audience that can now resonate with an audience. Like Three Fly, for instance. I feel like um, a lot of people do it too quick their audience doesn't have an opportunity to appreciate it. So the Mirage et Toi that we talked about earlier, that was my exercise to get people to really focus on the magic, to coerce them to pay closer attention, to really get them to focus, to try to catch you out so that uh, by the time you get to the fireworks at the end, they're ready to applaud. That was just an exercise, a creative exercise, but the focus wasn't on to push a product to the audience or to impress magicians. It, it's always been for the mind of the, for the spectator. So when, it, when I hear a question like, do I enjoy the creativity, creative side, or do I enjoy the performance? Because I, I've, I've, had, I've had that duality throughout my career. Um, the, only, the only thing that I've had to worry about when it comes to balance is time the time to put into that, like being able to come to London for a week to film a project and then bookending that with a bunch of shows that I'm doing for the lay public or ticketed events um, has been a challenge. But I, I would have to say in, in most of my career, it's been one or the other, or I'm doing one and I'm moonlighting in a very small capacity with the other. Um, but I'll give you another truth. Um, I'm, I'm not much for sharing secrets with magicians for money anymore. Okay. I'm not a big fan of it. I had a conversation with my, my buddy Derek Delgadio a few years ago about it. And I, I was looking at him like, what? Why? what? Why wouldn't you release that? Why wouldn't you put these thoughts out for the world to enjoy and consume? And he was like, because I created them so that I could use them in my show. I don't, I don't need everyone else doing my magic. That's why, why I'm here. Um, 
And he says, I'm, he, and it stood out for me. He said he just is not a fan of giving magic to the world for money or sharing secrets for money. And I'm like, at the moment, I didn't understand it because, you know, 85% of my income at that point was from selling magic tricks. And I said to myself a couple of years ago, wow, I get it now. Because what happened to me is I walked into a restaurant and was hanging out with a bunch of friends and the waitress asked me to do a trick and a guy who I was performing for said, I've seen that before. And I'm like, no, you haven't. I've never been here before. And he says, no, the magician who works here, he, uh, he, he does that. And he was doing one of my tricks and I couldn't do anything about it because I, uh, I sold it to him, you know, but, um, it's one of those things where, you know, kind of, kind of is what it is. Mm. That could have been that. Yeah, I can imagine that was very tough. But yeah, man. So, are we going to be seeing less from you as a as a as a as a producer of magic? Mm -hmm. yeah. There, there, there will be small things where I will be participating in projects. There's one more project that I plan on putting out this year, um, which is this really cool uh, Ace Assembly that I created for the virtual setting that also looks really good um, on um, in in real life IRL. Um, but aside from those two projects, I've got no intentions of putting anything else that I've created out until, you know, the beard is completely gray and I'm ready to put that one book out that pretty much catalogs everything. Mm -hmm. So because I know that books are going to outlive deep, any any visual medium. Uh, five years from now, we I don't know if we're, we're going to do uh, downloads anymore. I don't know what the next thing is. It's probably just going to be a microchip, you know, from one one head to a net to the next. Yeah. But uh, books are, are here to stay. They're never going anywhere. Less people are reading them, but the information is there, and that's the best way to keep secrets anyway. So I'll probably do a one big compendium um, of all my magic before I go. Wow. Okay. Well, that, get, that, that, that brings us back to your performing, you know, the performing side of your career. I want to talk a little bit about, because you've had some very high-profile gigs, um, and, and you're incredibly successful as a performer. Um, I suppose... Success is relative. Yeah, true, but for your average magician that are watching this, if you said you could have, take away all of the tricks that you've ever produced and all of the companies you've ever worked for, if you were told, well, you can go on Penn and Teller Fool Us and you can fool them and you can go on AGT and get to the semifinals and you can not have to worry about work and do really well and have this career, I think most people, most magicians would go, yeah, I think I'll take that. So it is subjective, but I think let's not sell yourself short here. Eric, you've done, you've done an awful lot. And the reason I say that is because, you know, it wasn't one thing that led to any of those things. It's the way that I was raised or reared uh, that led to an attitude about the world. And forging the relationships that I forged over years as I learned magic opened doors, which allowed me to learn better magic and become stronger in certain aspects of magic. And that led me to creating a routine that was good enough to fool Penn and Teller. Uh, and that led me to producers who saw that say, I think this guy would be good enough to be on America's Got Talent. So, you know, what a lot of viewers are gonna see, if you're not familiar with the magic that I've created, you see the, the television credits, but I wouldn't be at that television credit level without everything that came before. It just wouldn't wouldn't be here. So, uh, the, the, what do they say, it takes 30 years to become an overnight success? It sometimes can take longer than that. And that's that's what we're looking at. So people who may see all of the pros to the, the what they perceive my lifestyle from social media and from what, what is posted, there's a, there's a lot that goes into that and not everyone's built for it. Um, and if anyone is interested in becoming a full-time magician, the first thing I'm going to tell you, don't even try to make 100% of your income from magic until you have a year salary saved. A more, more would be great, but until you have at least a year's salary saved, because you're going to have to put that into marketing, you still have to eat, you still have to pay all of your bills with no income coming in and no guarantee that you're going to have any income coming in. So you have to be able to live for at least a year before you can start making that work for you. That's the first thing. The second thing, which should have been the first thing, is you have to have an act. Yeah. If you don't have a show, you've got nothing to market. You can't just go in and say, I'm going to do a bunch of tricks and that's going to be it. It has to be a cohesive show. It doesn't have to have a through line. It doesn't have to be super thought provoking like Derek Delgadio's show, but it has to be a cohesive unit that feels like a product. 
So until you have that, I wouldn't consider it. The third thing I wouldn't consider uh, doing magic full time for until you're at this point is when you're earning more money from the magic than you are working your nine to five or whatever job you're working. Because that's what happened to me. I was making more money evenings and weekends doing shows and lectures and performances uh, at conventions and things like that than I was working for State Farm. So when I got fired, I said it was bittersweet because, you know, I hate to go, I hate to leave the 401k, but this is kind of calling my name. I'm doing better here and I'm happier and I'm working less hours. Um, so those three things are the three pieces of advice I would give. Um, and oh, the other thing, find a mentor. Find a mentor. Find someone who's smarter than you, who's been doing it longer than you, and shut up and listen to what they have to say. They've been doing it for 20 years and are successful at it because they're doing something right. Even if you don't like them as a person, listen to what they have to say because you don't have to like them in order to, to take... What's the old saying? Uh, eat the meat, spit out the bones. Yeah. So take yeah. what you need, leave the rest. Um, and that's really... Oh, also, and this is important for people who are even getting into it now, who are actually doing the work, who are actually doing magic full time. Surround yourself with creative people who don't do what you do. Form a hive mind where once a month, twice a month, even weekly if you can, get together and make each other accountable for goals that you all want to accomplish in, the, in, that, in that hive mind and help each other find ways to use the talents that your skill set and your talent to help them get to that level. Well, it might not be magic, it may be what I've done in marketing or the people that I've worked with or some of the agencies that I've worked with that might help you because you're a singer or because you're a painter or because you're a, a wordsmith, an artist, a poet, whatever the case may be but they can also help you with your scripting. They can help you with your staging. They can help you with so many other things that'll be beneficial to you and your business. So that is just as important as, as everything else that I've talked about because one man can't, can't do it alone. Uh, you, have to, you have to form a group, a collective, that'll, that'll help you gain everything that you need in life. And one of the things that you said over and over there was your business, your business. And I think it's important Anybody who's watching this that wants to become a professional magician, they need to understand that it is a business. You might be on your own. You might be, you might not have an office full of staff, but it's still a business and it needs to be treated like a business. And I'm, I'm gonna, not going to lie. I'm, this is something I'm still working out. Um, I've always said if I ever go back to college, it needs to be for something in business so I can understand uh, that aspect of it better. Uh, in the meantime, if you don't have the marketing uh, expertise yourself, if you don't have a business mind yourself, because so many of us, all we want to focus on is the magic, the slights, the, nu the nuance, all of those small things. If that's not you, you'll need to pay people who are smarter than you to handle all of that around you. And that's what I do personally. I, I, ha I have an accountant. I have a manager. I have people who handle everything so I can focus on the art. That's very good. That's important. It really is. It really is. Can I, can I ask, we, re we referenced, and, and I, I really hope that the people that are watching this are listening to every word you're saying, because this is a masterclass on, on, on magic and business, and this is absolutely brilliant. Can we just very quickly circle back to AGT? Because okay. a lot of people that I've spoken to, they're, 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 they're saying, hey, I'm going to go, do, I'm going to do Got Talent. Got Talent. I'm looking for my big break and this is going to be the way that I get my big break. I'm going to audition for Got Talent. I'm going to, I'm going to get myself on TV. I'm going to get an agent. I'm going to be super successful. As somebody who's gone on Got Talent and done an incredible job, um, do you have any advice on that side of things? Oh, that's a, that's a really tough question, Craig. And the reason I say it's a tough question is because I hated my entire AGT experience. Oh, right. Every, every moment of it, hated every bit of it, but I wouldn't have traded it for the world because of what it's done for me. Um, the first thing that you have to understand is that those types of talent shows are reality television. Once you sign that contract, they can spin you in any light they want. They can make you the hero that you probably are, or they can make you look like a complete heel. It's their discretion 100%. So if you go onto the show understanding that they can make you look like shit and that's okay for you, it's not gonna hurt your ego or your career, go ahead. You can go ahead and do that. Um, if you're a little bit more protective of your, of your brand, I've seen people who got four yeses and in the edit, they made it look like it was they were booed off. 
So, you know, it, it could go either way. Um, so um, that's, that's definitely one thing. Um, once you've gotten past that and you decide this is something that you do want to do regardless, um, one of the other things that I would say is make sure that everything that you're doing is TV ready. That's one of the big mistakes that I made. Everything that I did, w w there were pieces of magic that I could do out in the real world, but they weren't necessarily framed properly for the unblinking lens of a camera. And uh, especially when some of the things were filmed live, there were things that would have worked in a real show because you'll never see it again versus things that you'll see if you hit the rewind button five or six times on YouTube uh, and go back and watch a piece of magic to, re to figure out how it's done. And not just magicians, of course, laymen as well. Um, I'll, I'll give, you know, one of my most embarrassing moments, uh, during my quarterfinal, I did a thing with a pane of glass that I walked through, but prior to that, I, uh, had Howie Mandel sign a playing card on, on an X with a little line on it, and, uh, he shuffled the card into the deck, he comes up, he smears the cards around, I show my hands empty, and I pull the card through the glass. Um, this is an all magician audience, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, uh, so the way I did it is I had a duplicate. I had a friend of mine say, oh my gosh, I'm a huge fan, but I'm a magician. Can I do a trick for you? And then maybe get your autograph. Uh, so he signs the X and how he signs the card. That's how I get the duplicate. The du duplicate's in my jacket. When on live television, there's no way you can anticipate this is going to happen, but on live television, how he's left-handed and the way, I'm sorry, he's right-handed, but the way he signs the card, the X is like this, but he signs it at an angle rather than straight. So there's an obvious difference between the two cards that I couldn't have anticipated. And this is live television. Can't even do it over again. So he puts the card in, shuffles it around, the cards go up. I use that cover to pull the card out, stick it to the glass so I can show my hand empty, and I pretend to pull that card through the glass. The cards fall. Everything looks good, and it's good enough to advance me to the live round because that's what the audience sees live. But on YouTube, you go back, and you're like, wait a minute. Hold on. Did I just see that? Watch it three times. Oh, one cock to the side, one straight. This is not real. He's a fake magician. So you have to be prepared for the comment section. <laughs> you have to be prepared. So whatever you do, if you go onto the show, make sure you're also prepared to, to not feed the trolls. Um, but you know, again, that's live television. This is what happens. It's just, you know, part of the journey. Um, so be prepared to have all of your magic be television worthy. If I could go back and do it all over again, I wouldn't have gone on that season. I'd gone on the next season and taken a year to create five or six pieces. Actually more than that, because what I ran into was every time I presented an idea, it was shot down because it looked like something that one of the other hundred magicians who've been on the show have done before. Um, I wanted to do something where, um, from a guy named Mike who's out in Las Vegas. What's, what's Mike's last name? The guy who does the, the robot. Mac, is it Maxwell? Yeah. Mike Maxwell. He, uh, he has a thing with a birdcage that's covered. Um, you walk into the audience and you borrow a ring from a lady. You wave over the ring and it changes into a key. You take the key onto the stage, you bring the lady onto the stage, you uncover uh, this big birdcage, you put, have them put the key in. It starts an automaton. And there's a little bird that sings a little song. It spits out an egg or lays an egg the egg comes down this rube goldberg thing lands into a golden nest the spectator can then take that egg crack it open and their ring is inside freaking amazing yeah. self-working all i have to do is a slight sleight of hand to switch the ring and the put the ring into the to the egg it was shot down because someone else did uh the orange the egg the walnut Completely different, totally completely different, right? different, but because they thought the audience would remember this situation where someone cracks an egg open, they told me no. And every trick that I wanted to do was shot down for the same reason. So you have to have a pretty large arsenal of magic. When it came to like Shin Lim and Eric Chen, theirs was non-negotiable. They said either I'm going to do this or I'm going to walk. I'm going to do what I've got prepared or that's it. You haven't seen anything like this before. The only other person who'd used a black tablecloth for any of their magic was Will Sai in the season that I was on. He didn't, he, he, I think he got eliminated the second round. Um, so they'd never seen magic like this before. And Eric brought something to the table that uh, Shen didn't, which is why they both were, went on pretty far. Um, but again, it's a situation where you have to be prepared. 
And if you're not, then you're not ready. I was I'll be honest with you, I wasn't ready. I, I'm very surprised that I got as far as I, as far as I did. My goal was to go on the show just to get one 15 minute clip that I could, a 15 second clip that I could use uh, in my promo reel to raise my rates. That's all I wanted. And I was like, if I can make it onto the show twice, that's a win. Third time, I'm like, the hell is going on here? I should have been eliminated. Fourth time, I'm like, am I going to win this thing? No, I'm not going to win this thing. It's not going to happen. And if reality hit in the semifinals, but I, I never expected to go as far as I did. But if you don't plan, if you don't, uh, if you if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Yes, that's the old saying. Absolutely. That, again, brilliant advice. Now I've got two more questions for you. I know you've got to shoot off soon because you're going to the cinema tonight. So uh, Venom, Venom, Venom too. Very exciting. Loving. I've got a. Yeah, that's, I'm I'm a child. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I I love I absolutely love Marvel. That's awesome. <laughs> love Deadpool as well. Um, so two questions to finish off. We, we sure. at the very beginning you talked of the interview. You talked about connecting with an audience, and to be honest, I've I've, I've watched your career. I've followed your career. I've always been a huge fan, as you know, Eric. And, and I, despite how amazing you are at sleight of hand and coin magic and card magic and, and everything that you do, it's that connection that you seem to have with an audience that for me, I'm not going to say it's unique, but it's one of your big selling points. It's something that I don't see many magicians do as well as you. You can just literally, and I've seen you do it live. You know, I've seen you live many, many times. I've seen you walk up to a bunch of magicians in a bar within three seconds they're just listening to you every word. You've built that connection. Is there any advice on doing that? Because ultimately, that's that's what magic is all about, and it's something that you do so well. I don't know that it can be taught. I think I'm sure it can be. I haven't I haven't spent any time trying to replicate it for other people, other than to say, you know, for me, it started off with performing in the restaurants. Uh, when I first began performing in the restaurants. Uh, I was doing it for free. I was doing it for literally for tips. So they have to like me enough to give me five bucks. Um, so I found that I had to be the best version of myself, uh, which all, wasn't always, it didn't feel genuine because I felt like I was being on my best behavior. Um, but back then I was looking for acceptance. The old Eric dressed in a suit and tie all the time because he wanted to uh, I was pretty much trying to fit into what I thought people thought a magician should look like. You know, Jeff McBride always says you should always look better than your audience. And, you know, I agree to certain points, but then I look at him and he's in a costume because that's how he feels a, a mage or a magician should look. I never wanted that. So as I left the idea of uh, being a better version of myself to being me, and I started dressing more like this, is I would wear this to, to perform on stage. Uh, whatever I'm wearing, that's my costume because I want to be me on stage. I don't want to be uh, a hyper better version of myself. I, I want to be as relatable, not as a character, but as my true self or as true to myself as I can be uh, while presenting on a stage uh, uh, full of lies. Um, the old saying is if they like you, they'll like what you do. That is true. But some of us are assholes. So it, that's why I'm saying I think it's difficult for us to say um, that it can be taught because then you're a sociopath because you're, you're secretly a jerk who's portraying to be a really good guy. My advice is always just to be good to people. I treat everyone, everyone the way I'd want them to treat my mom or to treat my dad. Everyone gets treated like a king around me. If I don't have time, I'm going to tell you, I, I wish I had more time, but I have this, this, and this to take care of. Perhaps the next time we can hang out, we'll, we'll do something. Uh, if, I, if I don't like what you're saying, I'm going to you know, agree to disagree and try to move away amicably. On stage, because I understand they have to like you within the first 15 seconds, and that's the hardest part. Well, the two hardest, I'm just as quick as a side, because I know you've got another question. Uh, 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 the two hardest things for a magician to do 
is to be liked within that first 15 seconds and to find a way to define you as a performer separate from all others. Finding what makes you different from all of the other magicians out there are the two hardest things on the planet to do. And you have to find both of those in order to really be successful. Um, but again, it's, yeah, man, I, 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 I could go on forever. I really could. So I'm going to leave that there and take that half answer and I'll whole answer the other one. It's great. It's great. I, I agree with everything that you said. Uh, and hopefully one day we can do a second interview and we can really expand on that. But what you've said love to. absolutely makes sense. One final question, which is what's next? Is there anything? And, and I know, you know, you said earlier on success is, um, you know, one person's success in the other. And I totally agree. But you've had an incredible career. You know, if you said to the Eric Jones back in the day that got his first copy of Bobo's, well, you're going to have worked with this company and done this and done this and traveled the world and had some of the most popular best-selling magic tricks of all time and sold out lectures. Oh, and by the way, you're going to do this on this TV show and this on this TV show, and you're going to get paid a lot of money to travel on cruise ships and, and go and perform all over the world. I'm sure if I went back in time and spoke to that young man opening that book of uh, of magic for the first time he'd be like wow so you you've you've done great but thank you thank you have you. i mean but i'm sure you're not done and i know you said that you're moving away from lecturing and releasing products and that's fine but i know that you're also a very uh, a very ambitious individual so is there anything left that you want to kind of tick off on your magical bucket list that you haven't achieved or anything that you'd like to do in your magical career that, uh, because you mentioned earlier on the importance of goal setting. So what goals have you got moving forward that you would like to um, hit? Well, Craig, as, as you said, you know, had I looked back at old Eric and told Eric that he would have accomplished all of these things 20 years ago, I wouldn't have believed it. I don't like the fuck out of here. There's no way. I've, I've never been, you know, to Washington, D.C. at that point. There's no way any of this is going to happen. Um, but as far as the goals that I have now, um, life has changed for me in a couple of different ways. My goal is to, to get married. I've got an incredible woman. Uh, my goal is to get married, be a good husband to her, be a good father. Um, and those goals supersede everything else. Everything else that I do is a, a means to end to make my family happy and make sure that they have everything they need once I'm gone. Um, I, if I died tomorrow, that would be my only regret that I didn't, you know, build the family the right way uh, and that I wasn't able to see my, my kids grow up to be amazing. Um, but as career-wise, if I died tomorrow, it was good, all yeah. good. Um, but if, if, if I do get to live another 25 or 30 years, um, I'd love, well, shit, hopefully 40, but if, um, if I get more time on this planet, I wanna help other people achieve their dreams. I am working now to build relationships with a bunch of people so that I can either open my own talent agency or an event planning company so that I can work closer to home, to be closer to my family, so that I can send other people out to live their dreams the way I have and put people in positions where they can make money um, the way I've, I've been able to. And that's a huge thing. Um, I've got a few things in the works right now. Uh, I'm under an NDA, so I can't talk about any of the TV stuff, um, but there's stuff on the horizon that'll be really good. Um, I am back on cruise ships, so if you, if you, I, I won't say the cruise line because I'm not able to say that publicly yet, but I'm back on cruise ships as of Saturday. I don't know when this is going to air, but as of the third weekend or the third or fourth weekend in September, I'll be back on cruise ships. Um, oh, I've been made the uh, artistic advisor for a theater in Pittsburgh called Liberty Magic. It's a 68 seat theater uh, dedicated solely to the performance of magic. It's run by the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust. They own and operate like 85 different venues with a huge operating budget. And what I love about this, even though I love the Magic Castle, I love House of Cards, the Chicago Magic Lounge, Monday Night Magic, all of those places, um, this place wants you 
for a month. So you get a month long residency. Uh, so the venue becomes yours for 30 days to modify any way you want that helps your show. You have a staff of people who are there to make sure you're successful in that show uh, in a way that no other venue I've ever worked has been able to. Uh, so it's, it's made specifically to, to have talent there for a month to shine. And it's nothing but lay audiences. Very few magicians come to the show. So it's, it's incredible. You're not going to have a bunch of people sitting with their arms folded, taking notes silently on how you do your tricks so they can add it to their shows. None of that BS. It's all you being great. And we've hired some of the world's best. I'm performing there in February. Um, we've got Todd Robbins coming in October, Chris Capehart in October, uh, Siegfried Tiber, um, Jade, uh, the Evisons. So it's, it's a great list of, of magicians and it, more, more and more are being added in 2022 and 2023. Uh, so again, that's a, just a way of me helping other magicians realize their dream by giving them a place that they can really shine to showcase their talents while earning a hell of a wage because it pays well. Like if you took the Magic Castle, if you work the Magic Castle for a month, that's one week at Liberty Magic. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's incredible. So that's pretty good. Uh, so, um, yeah, things like that, but that, that's, those are more short-term goals. But again, that long-term goal is to help other people realize their dream by either having a talent agency or an event planning company or a combination of the both where I can have other people who are in the entertainment, uh, or the visual arts or in the entertainment industry go out and find audiences to entertain and realize their vision for their dream. Incredible. Incredible. That's, that kind of sums up who you are as a person, because I know that you're all about giving back and you're all about helping people. And that goal does not surprise me. And to be honest, I think, Eric, knowing how ambitious you are and what you've achieved, you'll hit it. Absolutely, 100%. Oh, thank you, brother. I really appreciate it. Fingers crossed. 100%. Thank you so much for this interview. This was incredible. And it, it genuinely was. I was so excited when we finally got our calendars to mesh. Um, you know, I've been a big fan of yours for a long time. It did not disappoint. Where can people follow you on social media? Is there a, 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 what's the best platform for you? Is it Instagram? Is it YouTube? All of them. Hey, perf look at that. True pro. We didn't even yeah. talk about the virtual stuff that you've been doing. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, know, so but... On everything, pretty much, at Eric Jones Magic. Perfect. There you go. So that's where you need to follow. That's fantastic. And do you, st I know you're not really doing um, really much in the terms of, of releasing products, but is there somewhere people can go to buy your stuff directly or is it best yeah. to go through dealers? Yeah. yeah where, if where can you people... happen to be on Instagram, if you go to my link tree, I've got a, a small site separate from my main website where I only sell product. It's not passcode protected. So you only go to it if you know where to look. Uh, so if you go to my link tree and click on uh, buy merch, you can buy uh, my new decks of cards that came out through Vanishing Ink called the Isoteric deck. I've got two versions. You can buy my, my tour t-shirt that says uh, Sorcerer on it, but it's in the um, um, uh, Supreme box logo style. So it's kind of like saying Sorcerer Supreme. Uh, so it's got that and it's got my logo on the back. Um, I do have a few pieces of magic available for sale, but very few. Uh, things that w if you were not, not a magician and you opened it, you would wonder what, what the hell am I looking at kind of thing. So it's a kind of a deterrent to keep regular people from buying it. Uh, but yes, I do have a few things on the website, including my metal series. Uh, and as far as the metal series is concerned, you can only get those from Illusionist in a video, like a, a download, streamable download. Um, I am the only person who has DVDs available and I have less than 100 uh, copies available permanently. Uh, so when they're gone, they're gone. So if you're interested in a copy, if you want to get interested in magic with coins and you like the way I teach magic, talk about magic, I'd encourage you to buy it for me directly through that link tree on my Instagram. Awesome. And and seriously, I've said this before on the channel, the Metal Series is incredible. It is absolutely oh, incredible. Well, and it really is the go-to for people that are learning coin magic. So if you, if you haven't got it, go and jump on that link tree because... Definitely, people need to get that. Awesome, bro! Thank you so much. I oh, appreciate cool. this time. Now you've got to you've got to get off to uh, to to Venom. You can't miss that. So I'm, I'm not going to miss Venom. I'm you're not going to miss Venom. So <laughs> thank you again. Hopefully, Love we you, can revisit this again in the future. Um, but yeah, guys, leave a comment down below. Let Eric know what you think. Thank you so much. You are an inspiration. I love you loads, Eric. Thank you so Love much. Me too, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Goodbye, everyone. Mm -hmm.